increasingly over the years had come to the view that the danger of war between East and West is far less and far less important than what is happening in the Third World or what is not happening in the Third World, the failure of things to happen in the Third World. And it was this that increasingly over the years made me want to go there and write about that. Nothing is happening in the Third World. Uh, now that I've been there and seen it, there is so much that needs to happen. There is the misery, the poverty, the despair. All that, something needs to be done. At least, and before anything is done, we have to know about it, we have to understand it. Not that we can do anything about it, it's the people there that must do things about it. But it's one world. Well, I had decided to go to India in the first place, and I had indeed gone to the south of India because someone told me that the climate was better and easier, that there was one area where it was uh, more moderate. Uh, and I found on my arrival that what to those people was moderate was quite unbearable to me. And after traveling around the villages, from one village to another, and staying in some, and in the end I wound up in the Himalayas looking for a cooler place, and I found it at the time, but then later it got hotter, almost as hot as it had been in the south, but by then I'd become acclimatized and I was able to bear it. You see, traveling around, I found very soon that there is not even a typical Indian village, never mind a typical third world village. Every village was different, but they had some things in common, and that poverty and misery and distress, ignorance, illiteracy, all these things are common to all the villages, and as far as I'm concerned, every Indian village is typical, wherever you go. To get there, you have to travel for about a day along very indifferent roads from the nearest town. Um, you get to a point where you get off the motor vehicle that you're traveling on, and you clamber down a very, that's all in the hills obviously. You, you have to get down a very steep hillside to the river. At that point, there is no bridge, but they have got some makeshift uh, contraption, two ca a cable stretched across the river, and a kind of um, orange crate thing suspended from it, and a pulley. And, and you pull yourself along across by a across this cable to the other side of the river. Now there it's flatter, it's a kind of river meadow, but very soon the ground starts climbing again and you with it until you get into the hills. It could be several hours before you get to the village. And it's, by then it's quite a steep climb. Um, there is hardly a level piece of ground there. Level ground is too valuable. You, you, you surround it with walls, you terrace it, and, and you, you, you grow things on it. And so the houses are mostly built into the sides of the mountain, or the back of the houses usually, and the front usually where I am faces the village square. The village square has a temple uh, on it. Uh, and, and so one side where I am has houses, but the other comes to a sharp stop where they've built up the sides, and there is a sheer drop from the square down below onto other houses. But those other houses below, incidentally, are the houses of the untouchables, they are segregated. Uh, and um, he is a very central character. He uh, drums the reveille at half past four every morning. It's very important that everybody should get up before daylight because they have to be in their fields by daylight, otherwise they would be wasting very valuable daylight working time. And there isn't that much of it because they've got to get through as much work as possible before the sun gets really hot. So they have to be there by daylight, hence. Um, then he drums the curfew again at 10 o'clock at night. Now. Again, why 10 o'clock? Because people have to get to sleep uh, in order to be able to get up early if there is revelry going on, as sometimes there is in the village, it can also be a happy place. Uh, then people don't get to sleep and uh, they're not ready to get up to work. So the curfew is fairly strongly enforced, uh, so I was told, but I had in fact seen no need to enforce it. People do go to bed or, or, or they sleep on floors. I'm the only one who has a bed there. Um, now, he also drums several times in the course of the day in front of, of the temple, 
for the temple services. He has a hut very near the temple. It's a platform, really, with a roof. He's the only man in the village who hasn't got walls in his uh, house. He has no private life. And he's got a family, two sons, and they've got a wife. He is also the village barber, and he is obliged to give anyone a shave who comes to him in exchange for a, um, a pancake kind of thing uh, baked out of very coarse grain. Yes, you see, I don't want to give the impression that nothing is being done for these people. The government in India tries very hard. I don't know that it achieves much in those sorts of circumstances. But for instance, he was given government land. He was landless. He is, in fact, owned by the village. He was bought by our village from a village further back in the hills. Bought for, I suppose, the equivalent of about uh, two or three hundred dollars 20 years ago. What so would be two or three hundred dollars now. Right. In order to make it possible for this person who had been bought and therefore was virtually in a position in a relationship of slavery to the rest of the village, to, to have some kind of life. Uh, but, uh, and he worked that land, he, those two so sons of his, and he built a terrace around it. They really worked very hard for several years to, to bring it into the kind of state where it would yield something. And almost as soon as it did start growing things, the farmer, a rich farmer, came and said, you get out, that's nothing, that's not yours. The, the drummer had the, the government deed that showed his ownership, but the farmer said, that's nothing to do with me. I bought that land from the previous owner, get out. And, and he beat him up, and, and, and he got out. And, and, you know, I told him, why don't you go to court? I mean, this is a simple case. You've got proof. And he said, to court? That means three days to get to town, to stay in town, to bribe the clerk, to get the documentation. You see, that proof is not itself sufficient. There are all sorts of other documents that would need to be got. They wanted him to do the drumming. They wanted him to do the shaving. Another of his jobs is to escort the village wives when they go back home. Usually the wives in our village come from other villages, and they do that in order to prevent too much inbreeding, because the village is like one big family, or at least each caste is. There's no intermarriage between the castes. So the wives usually come from other villages. They very often go home for festivals, holidays, family visits. And then it's the duty of the drummer or his sons, if the husband or a member of the family is not available, to escort the wife. When he got the land, he and his sons spent so much time on it that they somewhat neglected their duties. And that the village resented very much because it had bought them. It felt entitled to those services. And very soon those pancakes that he was getting for shaving people were very much harder to come by. Uh, they had been paid a kind of uh, wage in kind. Uh, at every harvest time, they would go around the houses of the farmers and people who owned land and would be given a small amount of grain in payment for the services they had performed. That too began to dry up. So on the one hand, they had land and they were growing their own grains. On the other hand, the income that they had had before was beginning to be drying up. And that is why progress is so terribly slow, you see. I don't think that you can do it by, even just by giving land. Agrarian reform is not enough. You need uh, political reform, you need social reform, as well as economic reform. It's only by combination of all, by a combination of all these things that one could ever make any kind of progress. He was one of the poorest men in the village. And he was fishing. He, he tried to supplement his income by fishing. They fish by walking in the river with a net. And he slipped on a stone. And so far as I could find, he only cut his knee, so in that position. Um, but apparently things got, things got into the wound. It, it, there did appear to be some kind of break in the leg. It, and it grew together in a very unfortunate fashion so that he, he was limping. Um, now, when I saw what had happened, I, I, I had heard that things like that could be put right by breaking the leg again and putting it together and, and regrowing it. And I tried to arrange for him to go to hospital. 
and uh, at first he agreed, but then when I tried to find him to make the final arrangements, I could never find him. And, and he kept, I, I found that he was avoiding me. And finally I ran him down to earth in, in, when he was working in his fields, um, in his one field. And uh, I found that he just didn't want to go. Um, he said, how can I go? What, what will I do with my wife and children? In fact, the usual method or the usual system there is that if you go to hospital, you bring a member of your family with you or several members of the family because the hospitals only provide medical service. Clean they have you. to cook and clean and look after you. And he said, well, how can I bring all these people? Where will I get the money? And he didn't want to go. And, and then I said, well, perhaps that could be arranged because, you see, I know people in town. And I said, well probably could, could be taken care of. Uh, you, can, you can leave your people here and come to town on your own. And he would never, that was the worst thing I could have suggested. Mm -hmm. And he just refused. He still got a broken leg. And, and that means his work is much less effective. He, he did have more than that one field where I found him. He had a field by the river, which was irrigated, irrigated and therefore much more valuable. But this is now several times as far for him as it used to be because he limps. So he's trying to adapt the field by his house to terrace it, even though th this one has no water, in order to work this. Uh, and, and obviously, it, you know, on several occasions when I've been to see them, he was out. And the wife said, well, she didn't know whether that evening's meal was going to come from, and that was three or four o'clock at night. And that's the terrible thing about the village the insecurity, the, the lack of security from day to day, almost, from meal to meal for some people. And that goes back to the lack of security from season to season, from harvest to harvest, because you don't know whether the rains are going to come, whether they are going to be sufficient, and only that will produce a harvest. So they suffer from a certain kind of, of I suppose, material insecurity much as we suffer from emotional insecurity here, but in a way the two are the same. It, it wasn't that I, I, I had a very selfish interest there. Uh, I needed a privy. Uh, they go into the fields and do whatever is necessary, and I was expected to do the same, and I, the first, you, that happens immediately, as soon as the drummer drums at half past four in the morning when it's still dark, but then it starts getting light, and I used to get there it was light by the time I got there, and I found it really quite impossible to perform. So finally, I, I found that I'd walked for 40 minutes before I felt comfortable. But during that walk, certainly the last part of it, I got so far away from the village into such wild and beautiful country. I, I was climbing towards the nearest peak in the village. I'd given myself that as the objective. And I found that really, wherever I looked, the views were so fascinating. And, and you see, by then, the sun had started coming over the range, and you could see it striking the sort of edge and, and, and sort of shafts of sun coming through. By the time I got to, to, to my peak, I, I was so happy, I'd almost forgotten why I got there. So finally, that was the place that I chose. I, the fact is that uh, I had suffered myself a lot from stomach illness, certainly in the south, a little less so in the north, in the, in, in the Himalayas. Uh, and certainly people die like flies sometimes. They certainly die, have died in my village through diseases which are contracted because of the dirt, because of what's contained in the excreta. And uh, I tried to get them to build, to allow me to build a privy. Uh, hoping that perhaps that might also teach them the value of a privy. But I, I do confess my interest was really primarily selfish. And they wouldn't allow me. They said, well, if we uh, do that, uh, there'll be dirt in the ground. And I said, you mind dirt in the ground, but you don't mind the dirt on top where you leave it yourself? And they said, ah, well, you see, if we just leave it on top, then the sun will dry it into powder and then the rains will wash it away and we are clean again. But if we allow you to dig a hole and to keep putting the stuff in there all the time, it'll accumulate. 
I, the reason was that he thought he didn't want to use it, but he knew that this very strange creature, who is an object of some curiosity and perhaps authority also in the village, um, if I do that on his land, then he will be left with this object of interest and, and uh, it'll be like something very remarkable that he owns. So finally, it was he who persuaded the village council, which had originally refused me permission, to grant permission to build a privy on his land. When I went there, I thought that I was going to find ways of helping people or learn about the most effective ways and so on. What I found is that, uh, what I found is just how ignorant I am and how, how much I fail to understand what's going on. Uh, and certainly, I, I know what, what the Western aid programs are designed to do. I know roughly what they've achieved and so on. But I just cannot for the world of me see how 500,000 villages, half a million villages in India, how those can be reached by the kind of programs that are, are, are being arranged by Western aid now. No, the answer has got to come from within. We have a role to play, but I don't know what it is. And I suspect that all these uh, experts in Western aid don't really know either, because they've been at it for many years. We live at a time of very rapid, the very rapid spread of communications. Already, the villagers are beginning to know that there are different kinds of life, that there is a far greater degree of prosperity in the cities, the tremendous massive movement into the cities, and especially outside India too. You know, the, the, the ordinary things of daily life and comfort to us are to them dreams unattainable, but they do know something of it. And the kind of misery that they are suffering now is, as you said, much the same as it was in biblical times, but in relation to what's going on in the West, they know that uh, they can and should live better lives. And I am convinced, having seen what life is like, that it cannot go on endlessly, that sooner or later some leader will arise, uh, local, national, who will harness that despair to some destructive purpose. And I don't believe that the kind of troubles that will start, that they could be contained to India or to India and Pakistan if the trouble starts between them. India is only a symbol here, as long as I can stick it out. I, I, I find it much easier now than I used to, but I don't really give myself I don't look ahead more than a year at a time. I've been there for a year, I'm going there for another year.